mic just needs to be closer. Is that better with the mic? Hopefully. Good. Um, so anyway, so yeah, so we have, we have the common ion effect, which is just that, and this is a general thing for equilibria. Um, if you forget it, if you just for a moment ignore all the acid-base stuff, it's just another way of saying that um, it's just another way of stating Le Chatelier's principle. You know, we talked about if you increase the concentration of B, that's going to push this equilibria back towards the reactants. And so if I take fluoride and I increase the concentration of fluoride, it's going to push the equilibrium back towards the reactants. And the result of that is that you're going to form less H plus because H plus is on the product side. Um, that's all the common ion effect is. And it falls directly out of you know, the, the mass action expression over here, um, which is that Ka is constant. So if I start tinkering with the concentrations of uh, things in solutions, I'm gonna expect um, there to be some change to H plus. So if I just have a high concentration of this, that's going to give me one pH. If I have a high concentration of this, of HF and a high concentration of F minus, I'm going to expect that to give me a different pH. Um, and that happens in a, in a predictable fashion. Um, the reason, uh, or one of the, one of the, I guess, results of the common ion effect or, or sort of important things that come out of it is that we can create what's called a buffer. So for buffers, um, for buffers, this is when we have a conjugate acid base pair present, or let's just say in solution. So if we go back and we look at the, sort of the example that we worked through on Wednesday, um, you know, we have HF, I said your starting conditions, initially we have HF, which is there in one molar. And we have F minus, which is also there at one molar initially. And then, you know, we work through our change or whatever, and we can solve for this. Um, what's K for this? Ka. Say it was 7.2 times 10 to the minus fourth. Um, anyway, so we end up with this, uh, situation where we say one minus X, we've got plus X over here. We've got X over here, one minus X, X, X. Um, and so we can solve for K, we can solve for X. Uh, let's see, we can take this. Oops. So we can plug all these values in and Wait, we end up with this. Wouldn't it be one minus one plus X for F minus? Oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's an important part. Um, so if we plug all this in, We end up with this equation. Um, and so ordinarily for small equilibrium constants, so ones that are, you know, much less than one or like let's say less than 10 or something, 
um, which this obviously is, 7.2 times 10 to the minus fourth is a very small number. Uh, we can assume that X is going to be small relative to our starting concentration, especially if our starting concentration is something large like one. Um, and so over here, we can also assume that X is gonna be small relative to one. So the approximation is based on the relative size of X uh, when it's compared to some other concentration. That's what allows me to do it. So I can say, well, one plus X is gonna be about one and one minus X is gonna be also about one. That's why I can just get rid of X in those um, and it just allows me to solve the equation. Um, here, you know, you're, you can't get rid of this X because you don't have any, there's no relative concentration to compare it to. Whatever X is, I guess I would say whatever X is, right? It's going to be large relative to zero. So we can't do that approximation for that, right? If you want to try and think about what, when, and when we can and cannot do it. Um, if this is zero plus X, and the approximation is based on the idea that X is small relative to the number that we're adding or subtracting it to, is it possible for X to be smaller in magnitude than zero? Uh, and the answer is obviously no, no matter what X is, it's going to be important uh, for zero so that we can't get rid of this X here. Um, but if we do this approximation, what it simplifies to is So we come out with X is just equal to the Ka here. Um, and so we can go back in and we can remember X is we, ultimately when you solve for X, you would need to go back and relate it to the concentrations of the original species. That's what we did. That's what X, that's why we plugged X in. It was, it was a variable that was holding a place until we could figure out what it, uh, what the final concentrations of these things were at equilibrium. So you can say one minus X, whatever. If we want to calculate the pH, um, the pH, or we would want to just look at the H plus concentration, which is equal to X, which is equal to 7.2 times 10 to the minus fourth. Um, and then you can take the pH by taking the negative log of that. Um, so let's do that real quick. And I'll show you what a buffer is and how this all works together. So our pH ends up being 3.14. Um, so in addition to being able, in addition to just saying like normally we can say X is going to be small because this number is small. That, that's what that whole approximation is based off of. We're saying, well, I know that whatever amount of HF dissociates is going to be small because the equilibrium constant is small. So if I wanted to draw these arrows to kind of represent that, I could draw um, like a teeny tiny arrow at the top, meaning that not a lot of the reaction goes in the that direction. Most of the reaction stays to the left. So I'm drawing this bigger arrow to indicate that a lot of the reaction is just staying on the reactant side. And the smaller arrow is to indicate that only a small amount of the reaction is going to the right. And because of this, I can say that X is going to be a tiny amount just because very little of it, very little of HF is going to dissociate. And that's really what X represents. It represents the amount of HF that ends up dissociating to go to these products over here. So I'm saying X is small. So that's what allows us to generally make these approximations where I'm saying, well, one minus X must be just equal to about one. This is especially true. So it's, it's definitely, it's true for small K values, which we have here, but it's especially true if I have a common ion. Since we know that having a common ion on this side is going to suppress the amount of HF that dissociates, I can say, well, if it's, if it's valid normally when K is small, if I have a common ion that's present, it's even more likely to be valid. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. So does it matter if the reactant is a weak acid, which is partially dissociated in water when we are looking at the equilibrium constant? I, I'm not sure what you're asking there, that it definitely, 
the equilibrium constant dictates everything. Like the term weak acid, weak base, all of these different types of things are helpful for thinking about the chemistry. But if you just step back and look at equilibrium constants, those dictate more or less everything that's going on in a chemical reaction. So if you know the equilibrium constant, and you look at it through that lens, um, so if F minus was like 0.1 molar, would you not assume X to be small? No, you would still assume X is small. So, so I'm saying that like, that's a good question. So this, this is one of the problems with these approximations is like when, when can we assume X is small and when can we not assume X is small? So even if you didn't have the common eye on there, we could assume X was small because this number is pretty large, which I know is pretty vague. It is kind of vague, but you know, it's much bigger than like uh, times 10 to the minus fourth, for example. Um, this number is very large. And so even if we didn't have a common eye on, we could still assume that one minus X was probably gonna be about, about one and we could test that. Um, all I'm saying is that as we add F minus, that becomes even more true. So a 0.1 molar would still be valid. Um, I'm just saying that the approximation is even better as this concentration over here gets higher because it's going to suppress the dissociation of this. So I'm just saying, I'm not saying that the approximation is necessarily invalid when it's not there. I'm just saying it becomes even more valid um, when it is there. Good question. So, but generally speaking for the approximations, because I know those are small, those are confusing. Um, these approximations like one minus X, just I'm gonna say this one last time, like one minus X, for example, or over here one plus X is valid as long as K is very small. And the reason it's valid is because not much HF is going to dissociate. So the concentration that it, you're starting with is just going to stay uh, very close to what it originally was. It doesn't stay exactly that, but for algebraic reasons, like just as a trick to solve it, um, we can make that simplification. So the less this dissociates, the smaller X is going to be. So if we have a lot of this around all, as well as having a small equilibrium constant, that's going to make that approximation even more valid. So you can only assume X is small if the reverse reaction is occurring. You only are worried about X if the reaction itself is reversible and you're at equal, and you're having equilibrium. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Okay, cool. All right, so anyway, so um, work on the approximation thing and work through some problems and try and get a handle on what the hell's going on there. Cause I, I know from office hours and just from being in class that that's sort of a sticking point. Um, and it's just one small piece of this uh, kind of bigger puzzle. And I, I acknowledge that it is kind of confusing. When can we do the approximation? Why are we doing the approximation? Um, and the lines of when you can do that are blurry. And if you get, if you want to get down and like actually to the, when those approximations fail, it just gets, it just gets so complicated. Um, I think it makes things worse in, in certain terms of like, uh, trying to understand what's going on at, you know, at an introductory level. Um, we'd, we'd need another couple of weeks, I think, if we were going to get that fine detail. But generally, these approximations that you can just assume that X is smaller are good. Um, okay, so in a buffered solution, so getting back to this original idea here, in a buffer solution, right, we have a conjugate acid base pair in solution. And that's exactly what we have here. So I have my acid at one molar and it's a buffer because I've also dissolved some of its conjugate base. So when, it, when I say it's a conjugate acid base pair in solution, I mean that you have, I guess I just mean that you have both present. Uh, it's particularly true when you have it at in, in the initial 
when you're just starting in the initial period, right? Like if you're, so if you're trying to make a buffer, um, you will take the acid and the, its conjugate base and you'll add those both to solution. So why is this, why do we care? Why are we giving this a special name? So buffers, resist changes to pH. They resist changes to pH. So if we look at this system here, HF going back and forth between, let me think about the best way to kind of teach this. So there's an equation that's kind of useful, this Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. Um, It'll help us work through these calculations a lot faster. Uh, I don't know if we really care to derive it, but the, the buffers resist changes to pH. And they're composed of an acid or base and its conjugate pairs. So I'm just gonna call those conjugate pairs of acids and bases. So yeah, so you can, you can if you want to avoid dealing with the approximation, you can just solve them straight up. The reason I'm kind of digging a little deeper on the approximation is because the Henderson Hasselbalch equation is essentially just one big approximation. Um, it, it, it's an approximation that generally works and that the reason is for all the things I just told you. Um, if you do a little bit of math, yeah, if you do a little bit of math, um, We can get the Henderson Hasselbalch equation out of this. So, like, I don't know how useful it is to derive the equation, but I'll show you how to do it just because it's a nice, simple derivation. So, if you have the Ka, uh, let's say, let's say for a generic reaction, HA, going back and forth between H plus and A minus. I can write out my mass action expression for this. Um, if I want to make, if I want to get the Henderson House bike equation, uh, I can rearrange this. to be equal to this. So all I've done is I've, I've taken A minus and I've divided it over here and I've taken HA uh, and I've multiplied it times both sides. So now it's up here. So that's what I've got here. So I've set that, I've set, I basically just solved for, for H plus in this equation. So all these guys did, whoever they are, uh, was take this, rearrange it, and then take the negative log of both sides. So if I take the negative log of both sides, What I end up getting out of this because of the way logarithms work, now I can say the negative log of Ka plus, plus or minus. I always get my signs kind of wonky with the logarithms, so it'll be minus 
minus the log of H A over A minus is equal to the negative log of H plus. Um, so then if I want to keep on with this simple derivation, um, I'm going to flip the sign on the logarithm for H A over A minus. So I can say plus log of a minus over h a because that's how logarithms work. So if I change, if you change the sign out front of a logarithm um, for these types of things where they're divided, you just flip the uh, numerator and denominator. Oh, I think you got your sign wrong for the log. Damn it! Really? Yeah, because your those are being multiplied. So you have to add them. It's only when you divide that you subtract. I'm pretty sure. Because your Ka is being multiplied by that fraction. Yeah, but he flipped he flipped the sign. So like it was a negative log being multiplied. Uh, oh, you're saying here because it's Ka times HA. Yeah, but the, lo negative, the log itself uh -huh. is negative. Oh. So the negative log kind of gets distributed too. You are correct though. When you're okay. multiplying, you add. Um, but because this is a negative, it carries through. Anyway, logarithms, I don't know. They're, they're not like incredibly difficult to deal with, um, but the, it, it's, it takes a second if you, have, if you don't deal with them frequently uh, to get the little rules down. For whatever reason, I didn't hit those super hard in my like college algebra course or whatever I took in high school. Um, I went to school in Mississippi, so we had low educational standards. <laughs> All right. Uh, so anyway, so I end up with this. I flip those over to get this positive. And then what I end up seeing is that, so this negative log action, you know, we, we've, we have a, we call that the P, like so negative log of H plus, we can call that the pH because that's by definition the pH. And we can call this term over here negative log Ka. That's the pKa. Um, and we leave this term alone. And we end up with this nice expression here. Usually the way we'll write it Usually the way you'll see this equation written, so this is the henderson hasselbalch equation, is that the pH is equal to the pKa plus the log of A minus over HA. So this is a very handy equation to have. Um, and so, you know, if we go back and we look at this up here, this problem that I set up up here, where we have this and this, and we go through and we do the minus x, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I go through and I solve it using a rice table and I calculate H plus, uh, and I come out with a pH equal to 3.14. If I were to take that same problem, I block off a piece here and use the henderson hasselbalch equation, so I say, okay, well, the Henderson Hasselbalch equation is that the pH is equal to the pKa plus the log of A minus over HA. So I say, I, don't, I know this is a buffer. That's, that's what you have to identify. You say, I know this is a buffer because I have this conjugate base present and I have the, uh, it's acid present. So it's a buffer. So the Henderson Hasselbalch equation is a, is a good approximation to use. Um, then I can just plug in these values. So I could say, well, okay, the pH is going to be equal to the negative log of the Ka value, which is 7.2 times 10 to the minus fourth, plus the log of A minus, which is our conjugate base, which is this. Divided by the log of HA, which is the acid.
And then what I end up seeing is just that the pH is equal to the negative log. 7.10 times 2 times 10 to the minus fourth because log of 1 is just 0, so this goes away to 0. Um, which is equal to 3.14. Um, so the nice thing about the henderson hasselbach equation, and somebody asked this, yeah, sorry, how do you spell the name yet? Yeah, henderson hasselbach it's not, Henderson is easy to smell, spell if you're uh, from the United States. Hasselbach is not. Um, honestly, I didn't realize that Hasselbach had an L in it. So, uh, But yeah, if you search like buffer pH online, the henderson hasselbach equation will come up almost instantaneously. For obvious reasons, it's much easier to use. Um, so the assumption that the henderson hasselbach equation is making here is it's saying that it's basically doing the assumption that I did here already. So when I solve this equation, I said x is small for these pieces. Um, and so I don't have to worry about it. The Henderson Hasselbach equation takes that into account and says, well, um, whatever the change is in the concentration of A minus and HA is going to be small enough that I can just kind of ignore it uh, and just plug in the original values. Um, and that allows me to very quickly calculate the pH. Um, and so anytime you have a solution that's a buffer, which is what this is, where I have an acid and its conjugate base present, I can kind of skip over doing all of the rice table stuff, although that will also work, uh, and just immediately calculate the pH of the solution um, using this equation. Um, Yeah, so why do we care? Why do we give these things special names? Uh, why does it have its own equation? So buffers are really important because they resist changes to pH. So this piece that I've kind of just written here, um, in terms of like practical applications when you go on and do anything related to chemistry, like if you do work in a subject that deals with solutions. So if you're ever dealing with, with anything that takes place in solution and water, there's a very good chance that you'll be dealing with a buffer. So biologists deal with this, biochemists deal with this, um, oil and gas guys deal with this, like buffers and acid-based chemistry is kind of everywhere. Ocean environmental chemists deal with buffers. Um, uh, so yeah, so we can, we can look at this uh, idea of resisting pH, like what does that mean exactly? Um, So the henderson hasselbach equation gives us a nice tool kind of to look at how that works. So if we look at this, let's say, so now we can get back to kind of tying this back to this neutralization reaction idea that we learned about. Um, let me write it out in terms of problem. So let's say, let's say, let's say, let's say, let's say, let's say that we have a solution of, so, I don't know that you want to make a buffer out of HF because HS is, is really gross and dangerous. Let's see. Let me think. Um, I like HF because it's a nice, it's something you guys are familiar with. We could look at car, like acetic acid, which is a much common buffer, much more common buffer. Uh, let's say that you have, let's say I have a solution. Hmm. Yeah, let's say I have a solution of, so let's look at acetic acid. So, so acetic acid is a really, really common acid. This is what it looks like, CH3COOH. Um, so one confusing thing about acetic acid for some people is that it has these protons over here. Um, we don't have to get into why, but those are not acidic at all. So you can just ignore those. So unlike something like H2SO4, you know, where both of these protons are acidic, even though one of them is strongly acidic and one is not, these protons over here are just not acidic at all. So not everything that has a proton is acidic.
So, you know, if you're looking at, if we're using HA as sort of our model uh, reaction, this is A minus, and then obviously this is H plus. So this is what that would look like. Um, if we're trying to plug this into, you know, our henderson hasselbalch equation or whatever. The Ka for this, uh, I should probably know that this one's really common, so I should probably know this one off the top of my head, is 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth. Um, so anyway, so yeah, so acetic acid, super common acid. Um, you've probably had it before. It's vinegar, like if you have a white vinegar or something is basically just, or is literally a, a dilute acetic acid. Um, acetic acid, even though it's a weak acid, uh, it can still be extremely dangerous when it's super concentrated. Um, but in salad dressing, obviously it's fine. Um, let's take a look though. So if I have a solution of this, let's say, and I'm starting out with, let's do some large amounts. So like, so let's say I have a, let me write it out in a problem form. So we could say calculate the pH change. when 0 0.01 mole of, say, nitric acid is added to one liter of Yeah, let's say of a solution made from five molar acetic acid. Yeah, and we want to compare this. This is like part one of the problem. And compare this to the change in pH. I'll just let me just write it out as a separate problem so it doesn't get too long. Let's just start here. <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> so first of all, do I have a buffer? That's your first question. Um, so if you're trying to figure out like, so one of the challenges with this material is trying to figure out when, uh, one of the challenges here is trying to figure out when to use like what equations and what approximations and stuff. I know that's, that's, that's kind of the challenge of all this material. Um, so your first question here is just like, what, you know, what is this? Do I have a buffer? Is this a buffer? If, when I'm asking if it's a buffer, what I want to check is I say, okay, well, I have an acid. Do I have its conjugate base present? Like, do I have some concentration of its conjugate base? So if it was a buffer, it would say, I have a solution made of five molar CH3 of acetic acid, and I have some concentration of its counter or its conjugate base, uh, which is called acetate. So I'd have five molar of this, and then I would have some other concentration of, you know, like one molar CH3CO minus or something as well. But I don't have that, right? We don't have any CH3CO minus, so this is not a buffer. So I don't want to immediately reach for the henderson hasselbalch equation. I want to pull out a rice table. I also note, um, I also note that I have some acid up here. Uh, so I have to account for that. So now I'm just trying to figure out the pH of this solution. So what are the things that contribute to the pH here? So one is the 
this. So I want to solve this using a rice table. So I'd say, okay, well, I've got five molar of this. I start out with zero of this. I start out with 0. Oh, let me. So um, before I get into that solution, the other thing that we have present that's really important that affects the pH is going to be nitric acid, which is a strong acid. So, you know, I start out with 0 0.01 moles of this. Um, assume that the, the addition of 0 0.01 moles is done, like it's just moles, it's, you know, like it's, it's you're not changing the volume, the total volume at all. Um, we start with zero of this and zero of this, but at the end of the reaction, when it's finished, we have zero of that, we have 0 0.01 of this, we have 0 0.01 of this. This doesn't matter. This is the conjugate base of a strong acid. And those are always spectator ions. So that doesn't contribute to our calculation at all. Good answer, Ying Ying. Um, okay, so then I want to move on. So I look, I look at my strong acid first, and then I come down here and I want to solve my rice table. So I start out with point, uh, 0.5 molar of this. Um, I have none of this present, which is why it's not a buffer, because I'm not starting with any acetate in solution. Um, and then I have some amount of H plus over here as well. And then, so I want to set this up. I don't know how hard this is going to be to solve. Hopefully I didn't set up some um, impossible math problem for myself. And now I just have my normal rice table problem. So remember Ka is, what did I say? 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth. So Ka is gonna be equal to CH3CO minus. So I go in and I plug all this stuff in. Let's see, so I've got five minus X. And this is gonna be equal to 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth. Um, I don't know what X is exactly, like I don't have a good why are we starting with H? So the H plus comes from the strong acid. We are adding HNO3 to the solution, but like we're, we're, um, you could start by calculating the pH of the original solution, then add in the nitric acid and see how much it changes. That's a reasonable way to do the problem. Um, This, this is a faster way to do the problem, I think. Why did you put five minus six in the numerator? Did I mess up? Oh yeah, I just screwed that up, that's why. CH3CO minus. Okay, so we don't know what X is here, um, but we do know that The equilibrium constant is small. It's 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth. Um, 
it's 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth. So if we wanted to kind of represent that again with our equilibrium arrows, put a teeny tiny equilibrium arrow here, meaning that not a lot of that CH3COH is going to dissociate. Most of it is going to stay on the reactant side. So we know that X is going to be X is going to be small, at least relative to five. Um, it's probably also going to be small relative to 0 0.01. Uh, we don't have, that, that approximation isn't going to be like a huge help in solving the problem, but we could approximate it if we wanted it to. Um, so anyway, so we're going to make this assumption that five minus X is approximately equal to five. Um, let's see. Do I care about it? Actually, any other one? I'd end up with x squared. I guess you still end up with a quadratic. Let's also make the assumption, and we'll see if this holds, that 0 0.01 minus x is going to be approximately 0 0.01. See, this one, so my thinking is 5 is a big number relative to 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth. Uh, anything over 1 in these types of problems for concentrations is considered like a pretty large number. 0 0.01 is starting to get smaller. You know, it's still three orders of magnitude larger than 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth, but your approximation gets riskier the smaller this number gets, right? So as this number approaches zero, the number that you're subtracting or adding x to, the riskier your approximation becomes. Um, but you can do the approximation blindly and then go and look and see if it worked. It's not like if you do the approximation, uh, you have no idea if it worked or not. You'll know if it worked at the end when you solve for x, if x is a large number. So let's go ahead and do that approximation. We'll say that x times 0 0.01 divided by 5 is equal to 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth. So all I've done here is taken this x and gotten rid of it. That's where these numbers come from. So I'm simplifying this into 0 0.01, and I'm simplifying this into 5. And now I just need to solve that. Yeah, X is zero point zero zero nine. Yeah, so in this case, so in this case we see, so this is a good example. Um, so remember I was saying like, as this number gets smaller, my approximation becomes riskier. So now if I, saw, if I make this approximation here, if I say 0 0.01, this should be plus X. So if I, if I make this approximation and I say, okay, well 0 0.01 plus X, 0 0.01 plus x is approximately 0 0.01. And I go ahead and I solve. And I, what I end up seeing is that x ends up being 0 0.009, right, which is large relative to 0 0.01. So if I, if I want to test that, I could say, well, 0 0.01 plus x. If I'm saying that 0 0.01 plus 0 .00, 0 0.009, this is going to be equal to 0 0.0. One nine, which is not really that close to 0 0.01. If I want to look at it in terms of like ratios, 0 0.01, 0 0.09. Like if you want to look at it in terms of percentages, that's not even close. If you want to look at it in terms of percentages, that's equal to 90%. So if it's greater than 5%, we know that our approximation failed, okay? So our approximation here failed. This is how the approximations work. So.
But you can see for five minus x, it's really pretty good, right? Like if I come over here and I look at five minus x, five minus 0 0.09. Right, so that really is true. So 4.991 really is approximately five. So that approximation is okay. So that this is how the approximations work. It's how big is X relative to the number that I'm subtracting or adding it to. So now I can go back into my equation and solve it, but I'm going to, not be able to use the entire approximation. Oop, I'm out of time, damn it. Okay, so for homework, uh, I'll post some problems. I'll post some stuff for you to work on over the weekend in general. Um, for homework, finish this. And then also work it out where you Also work it out where we do that, but we also add in and okay. So here you're dealing with a buffer. So what you want to be drawing the conclusion, what do you want to draw is you calculate the pH for this one where you don't have the buffer. And then we calculate the pH for this one where we do have a buffer and we look at the difference between those. And what you should see is that the buffer concentrations don't change a whole lot. That's, that's sort of where we're driving towards here. Um, I wanted to, I like, I hate spending so much time on these math approximations and stuff because I know they're kind of confusing. Um, but like every time we have class uh, or office hours, I feel like most of the questions come up around that. So I just, I'm trying to go over it as much as I can uh, as we also try to push the material forward. So hopefully that's helpful in some way. Um, but so the way that I would solve this problem up here is to I would say, and you can think about why this approximation is valid based on what we talked about at the top. I would say, okay, well, X, I can't get rid of X in this term, but I can down here because I know five minus X isn't going to be ma isn't going to matter, and that doesn't. Let's see, X beats zero point zero one X, X squared. Yeah, so then you just end up having to solve a quadratic. If you keep the X in the bottom, I guess it wouldn't be that bad. You could solve that probably as well. But this isn't. This is a valid approx. This will be a valid approximation. So you can solve this equation, or you can just plug this all into some sort of solving software that one of your classmates. But, so the one liter doesn't really matter because the one liter is chosen um, to make things simple because it keeps things even. Everything is in mo like one molar, you know, or everything is divided by one to get the molarity. If the one liter was like 0.5 liters, then you have to worry about it. Um, because then you have to figure out, because then when you're looking at, for example, this 0 0.01 here, if I'm adding it to a 0.5 liter thing, now I have to worry about what the concentration of this is. It's gonna be zero point, it's gonna be half this, uh, it'll be 0 0.005 molar. But because it's 0 0.01 molar and it's going into one liter, it's just 0 0.01 molar. So don't mess with the HNO3. Uh, yeah, you wanna mess with HNO3 I'm not sure exactly how to do it. We're, uh, I'm going to post this video immediately after class. Um, go through and try and work through these problems. So here, the top part, this is just us practicing uh, neutralization, essentially, um, and using rice tables and stuff. 
uh, actually there's no real neutralization reaction to worry about, um, but just practicing rice tables. Uh, and then down here, we want to calculate, we want to practice, you want to use the Henderson Hasselbalch equation here. You can work through it if you want to with a rice table for practice, which I recommend, but you can use the Henderson Hasselbalch equation. So this is a buffer problem. So we're trying to connect this previous ideas that we have about calculating pH to this new idea of buffers, um, which isn't really that new of an idea. It's just a, an easy way to look at these things. So. Anyway, all right, you guys have a good weekend. Um, so we don't have a test next week, but we do the week afterwards. So um, definitely, definitely be working on this stuff. Obviously, it's, it, there's a lot to think about here. Bye, y'all.